I'm Jim Grismer, Professor and Dean Emeritus at the University of Denver. Welcome to Engaging Ideas, where we bring information and ideas from the academy to the community to help think about real-world questions. We know that an informed public is crucial to the functioning of democracy. However, national studies show a major decrease in news consumption among today's youth, which is a concern for many adults. A new book, Young People and the Future of News, tackles the subject head on. Joining me at the Crimson Table today to discuss this topic is the book's co-author, Professor Lynn Schofield Clark. Dr. Clark chairs DU's Department of Media, Film, and Journalism Studies and directs the Estlo International Center for Journalism and the New Media, which is particularly relevant to our topic today. Professor Clark is the author or co-author of six books and more than 50 articles in both scholarly and popular publications. I think you will find that she offers some engaging ideas on how the under 18 generation is redefining news, ideas that may spark your own thinking and encourage discussions with friends. So let's begin. my first question is what led you to this topic in the first place? <laughs> well, I teach journalism studies and I've been doing research with high school aged people in the U.S. for the last 20 years or so. And so I was really interested in learning more about how social media is changing the way that young people encounter news. And because news is related to politics, I was also interested in how that was changing the relationship with politics. Where are the important dimensions of this? What, what should we as adults be thinking about it? <laughs> well, I think there are three ways that social media has changed news quite a bit. It's changed how we define news or what news is, um, where we find news, and who gets to tell us what news is. And so when we talk about um, what news is, we know that actually young people have never really considered news to be their favorite medium, you know, their favorite genre. Uh, most studies show that they don't really pay attention to news. And actually, this is not something that's new. This is something that's gone on for a long time. For for at least the last 30 years, we've had the same kind of low level of attention to news among young people. But what is interesting is that there are still about 70% of young people who say that they care at least somewhat about news. So then the question becomes, well, what is it that they care about? What is the news? And how do we try to understand what, how they're defining news? And then in terms of where news is, it's now really found through the platforms. And so we have to look at social media and what's happening there. And what I think is especially interesting in the research that we found is who you get news from. Because I think as adults, we've thought about news as coming to us from formal news organizations. Mm -hmm. Whereas for young people, it's really less about where the news came from in terms of those organizations and who shared it with you. That's what becomes important. We'll, we'll delve into that um, more. I'm, I'm curious, how did you how did you look at this subject? How do you study <laughs> this kind of thing? What approach did you and your co-author take? Well, we have spent a lot of time with young people and so in a lot of different venues and mm -hmm. we also do a lot of reading. You know, that's what we do as professors. <laughs> right. So we've studied a lot of uh, the national surveys that have been done through the Pew Research Center, through um, the National Opinion Research Center, um, Associated Press. A number of organizations have put together studies about young people and news. So we wanted to look at all of the data that is out there about news and we also then wanted to really live sometimes with young people. So my co-author, uh, Regina Markey from Rutgers University, spent some time in Boston with a community radio station, and then also did some interviews in New York City, where she is. And then I spent a lot of time immersed in high schools in the Denver Public Schools, so getting to know students, both in class settings and then in after-school settings, observing them and talking with them about their social media uses. So this was a real hands-on kind of <laughs> kind of research yeah. that you that you and your your co-author were doing. Let's talk, you gave us a kind of a quick overview, but let's, let's dig down a little bit deeper. Um, share with us uh, the findings that, that have emerged from this in a little more detail and, and any conclusions that, that that's led you to. Sure. 
Um, I think the main finding that we have is related to the difference in the role that news is playing in society today. You know, we used to think about news going back in the United States, even to the time of Thomas Jefferson, we talked about the importance of the newspaper as being a role, pay, playing a role in relation to how people come to be socialized into a democracy. And so what we found in our research, though, is with the introduction of social media, we're seeing that young people are socializing one another into what it means to be informed and part of a larger democratic citizenship. T tell, tell me a little bit more about that. That's, <laughs> that, that's so, a different definition of news that yeah. I have traditionally had. It is, and I think it has to do with the things that are happening in relation to the social media platforms and how that's changing and how that's picking up on trends that have been going on for a long time in relation to how young people have learned about what's happening and what's going on. On. So what we were really interested in our study was young people who already have some interests in what's going on in their community. There are a lot of young people, you know, there, as I said, there are about 70% of young people who say that they're at least somewhat interested in news. So we know it's a pretty large group. We really wanted to focus on the young people who seem to have a particular interest in knowing what was going on and, and finding out what was going on with them. And so what we have studied is basically what we are calling connective journalism. And we use that term connective to refer to the connective capacities that social media make possible and how people use social media today and journalism because we also found that young people were using those social media platforms in ways that sometimes echoed the longer term traditions of journalism things like keeping a watchdog on power or holding leaders accountable and expressing opinions when leaders don't do what they're what they're hoping that they will do or what the the people hope that they'll do in response so i've talked i've talked to lots of folks about um, who, who observe with their children or grandchildren a very different kind of behavior yeah. in terms of, of news. I think many of us are used to thinking of news as, first of all, external to our personal experience, yeah. the, what's happening out there, mm -hmm. and secondly, um, information that is uh, collected, curated, and presented to us in a kind of an orderly way. Yes. But what you're describing sounds very different to me. Yes, that's right. And it is that big shift that I had mentioned before about thinking of news. Um, we used to be able to think of it, and I think I still do, <laughs> as relying on editors and newspapers and news producers to help us to know what's going to be on the front page or what's going to be at the top of the 6 o'clock news. And it's very different for young people. You know, when we talked with young people, they would say things to us like, well, I don't really need to check in with the local news or the national news because if it's important, the news will find me. And they'd say things like, you know, I don't really need to check news because it'll show up on my Twitter feed or it'll show up on Instagram. So, um, and in fact, the statistics have shown us, the studies have shown us from the Pew Research Center that something like between 90 and 95 percent of young people now say that they get their news from Facebook. And, uh, and also a lot of students also say that they get their news from YouTube and from, um, and from Instagram and other social media platforms. So we know that these things are playing an important role in how young people find out. And that means that rather than the editors deciding what's important, in a lot of ways we're finding that young people are relying on one another to tell them what's important and what's worth knowing about. That makes me think about uh, the, the sort of uh, journalism standards, the traditional journalism standards of balance, fairness, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, have the facts straight, mm -hmm. that, those kinds yeah. of things. It seems to me that the, that the social platforms are almost the antithesis of that because there's yeah. very definitely a point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, people say things that may or may not be grounded in, in facts, mm -hmm. uh, that they could be opinions and so on. Mm -hmm. So. Um, is there a way to crosswalk those, or are they just entirely different things? I, help me with that. <laughs> I think it is an important question. I mean, I think that this raises a policy issue, actually, for mm -hmm. us to think about as a society, because I think we have had news organizations that have taken on the responsibility of seeing themselves as, um, you know, being a light in darkness. You know, yeah. democracy fails in darkness, which is what the what the Washington Post says. Um, so we've relied on our news organizations to play two roles in our society. On the one hand to represent public and to f to answer to public interests, and on the other hand, to be businesses mm -hmm. and to still be profitable. And we've seen in the last several years that that's been a real problem as we've seen right. decline in subscriptions and, and decline of advertising rates within all news organizations. We're seeing a hollowing out of support for the traditional news organizations. Now, Facebook and social media have a completely different model. They don't have that same responsibility to the public. They see their primary mission as connecting people on the one hand, and 
then on the other hand, being a profitable business. Mm -hmm. And it's more profitable for them the more often we share things. And so that has a big role that has played, it has played an important role in what's happening in the lives of young people and how they understand things. Like for example, uh, you know, the issue of fake news became a really important issue this last year in relation to the election and yep. still has, is a very serious concern. Um, last year, Facebook made the decision that they would change their algorithm so that we all would receive more news, or we would all receive more information that came to us via our friends and connections. And that became privileged in the algorithms rather than news that might come from the Washington Post or legitimate oh. news sources. And that then, you can't, you can't really disconnect that from the fact that 8.7 million people shared the top 20 stories that were shared in fake news in relation to the election uh, that, that happened this last year. So we see that there is a role that these social media are playing. And I think the question for us as a society is, how do we want to hold those organizations accountable? Right now, they are taking a lot of initiatives on their own. And so, for instance, Facebook now has a program with AP so that they're tagging certain news and letting people know. They're, they're working with PolitiFact especially and Snopes, which are two places that are helping them to identify when there are sources that seem to be not not true, uh -huh. um, so that those can be identified. But I think it still raises the question for us as a society. You know, how do we want to hold accountable these organizations, and how do we want to say to the social media platforms that they are now playing a role, somewhat like New York Times did, and so we have to expect something of them on behalf of our public. Uh, this this strikes me uh, as a really profound shift uh, mm -hmm. from a social. So and a political yeah. uh, point of view. Um, and I, th I think it's interesting that your book, which, which has a title about young people, but it really, the thread really leads to a much larger social kind of discussion, it seems to, it seems to me. Uh Thanks, I hope so. And I, I do think that, you know, the young people are involved in democracy today and they will be our future. And so what they're doing now in relation to their practices with social media will help us to understand how information and news are being relayed in the future. Um, so what I had found when I was looking at this with my colleague, um, Regina Markey, we were trying to understand how young people engage and what's changed in relation to their, um, the way that they encounter news. And so we found, you know, as I mentioned before, that at one time there were kind of two options. You could either read or view the news or you could ignore the news. And that was kind of it for young yeah. people. Now with social media, there are new options. So you could read or ignore or view, but you also could choose to share or do something more with what you find on social media. And so that's what we were interested in. And what is the relationship between what they encounter and what they choose to do with it? So we found, for instance, that young people could do at least three different things in relation to how they encountered news and social media. They could share it, they could insert themselves into news, or they could try and go ahead and make a news story. And so, um, so those were three different things that we wanted to see. We saw a lot of young people that were involved in sharing what they thought of as news, or con and that would include not just hard news, but also things like commentary, satire, even times when um, news issues arise in in popular in popular culture, like in South Park. And the yeah. young people would talk about sharing links to things like that on their different feeds with their friends, um, because it says something about who they are. And so they enjoy being able to share that. Um, and we found really interesting things like, you know, that young people would often, you'd, when we would look at their feeds, for instance, you would see these things come up kind of woven in between unexpected things. So you might see somebody share something about Black Lives Matter, and right before that was a push-up challenge, and right after that, was a meme of cats watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> so it was, you know, and I think that's kind of the way we all experience politics today. It's interwoven into our social media lives and it's part of our everyday diets in that way. So young people do share things in, in that has one role to play, but then some people even go further and they may decide not only do I wanna share about this event or activity that's happening, but I wanna participate myself. Talk to us about that. I thought that was a particularly <laughs> interesting finding in your book. Yeah, and well, and I think we've seen that young young people, um, with the rise of social movements and the involvement of young people in social movements around the world, we've seen that young people now will take a step and be involved in things like the Women's March or Black Lives Matter or school protests against standardized testing in Colorado right. here. Um, that, uh, and not only will they be involved, but they will then 
curate their involvement. So they will take a picture of themselves and put it on their Instagram, which takes a little bit more interpersonal risk, you know, because a lot of young people, right. a lot of all of us, don't like to necessarily put ourselves out there as involved in politics. But we do find that some young people are willing to do that and willing to see themselves as participants in actions that are unfolding. There clearly are young people who are actively engaged in, in politics. How do, how do they use social media to leverage their own engagement and to leverage their point of view, perhaps? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that they, they many young people share things online as a way of saying something about who they are. That's really what That's social media is all about. And so when young people, and young people of course are very concerned about how other people perceive sure. them and think about them. We all are. <laughs> yeah, we all are, that's right. So, so they, uh, they have to weigh, you know, when is, when is it, when is it uh, something that they're willing to share and how are they going to share that? And they do end up getting a lot of pushback. We've done a lot of, you know, findings. We found that young people do experience sometimes microaggressions, for instance. So if they put something out there that their peers may not agree with, if they say, I stand with transgender young people, for instance, mm -hmm. and think that they should be allowed to serve in the military, um, there may be a, per we had one student who uh, made a, a comment on their web page and shared something and then found on their Facebook page, and then they had an other person come and make a comment that was um, kind of opposed to that viewpoint, and then put the names of all different people from their class, they tagged them on that post. So that that would mean that whenever you were checking your Facebook account, if you were tagged, that would show up in your feed and you wouldn't have to, you, know, you would, there was no question that you were going to see what this person said and the fact that you probably disagreed with it. So it <laughs> becomes almost a way of bullying that, that yeah. can go on among young people. So it's not without price when young people do step out and um, take some, some kind of a political stance. That's a, that's but a I do think point. that you're, you're finding still we're still finding within these social circles that young people are finding young people who agree with them and who support their perspectives and they're able then to develop publics and be part of something that's larger than themselves and I think that's a way that it does connect with how we've thought about democracy in the past because it's important for young people to find all of us to find people who not only agree with us, but are willing to find the evidence and find the facts that support the reasons why we think we do, and to make sure that we're operating on a factual basis, as opposed to operating on a basis that confirms our own biases. One of the things that um, has been evident is this so-called filter bubble, um, where we listen to news that uh, we agree with, get information, the idea of uh, affirmation instead of information. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we know that exists uh, in MSNBC and in uh, Fox News and so on, uh, and there are many. Um, but what about social media? What does, does the filter bubble effect exist in social media in the same way that we think of it in more traditional media? Social media actually exacerbates the filter bubble because what happens is that you are creating your own echo chamber so that we know that people are really exposed, even more so than ever before, to only views that they agree with. And I think this then further underscores the partisan nature of the conversations that we're having in public life today. And that has a lot of implications for us, I think, as a society. I think it puts a really important role on places that are not partisan places like schools, for instance, mm -hmm. and universities, mm -hmm. to have the kind of civil conversations that may not be happening in places like social media or places where we're interacting with people who tend to agree with us. We don't really have those spaces much right now in society. There's a tendency for us in schools and even in universities to think we need to back away from things that are sensitive issues. But we, I think it's really important for us to think about the role of education in helping to provide space Places for people to listen to one another and to do so with empathy. Um, I think that it can be very helpful for faculty members and teachers and students to receive training in how to listen to each other through these changing experiences that we all have and the different views that we may hold about what's going on in our world. 
Um, we are, and I think what happens with traditional media is you hear a lot of shouting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in relation to news programs, especially, and I'm thinking right. of things like Fox. You know that there are programs that are um, that are on the air because it's not only it's entertaining to watch, uh -huh. and so that tends to drive media uh, viewership um, in the traditional media. I think in social media people have the same kinds of responses, that what happens is that people will share things that they find outrageous um, or that they find very funny because it's something that confirms their own biases. So we'll see a lot of that happening in our own research about what young people tend to want to share uh, with one another, and, we, and I think that's true with adults as well. And that raises these larger questions, again, about what kind of a platform do we want and what kind of a society do we want? How are we going to make it possible for us to create a media ecosystem system that enables us to have these difficult conversations where we can really hear across difference. I think about the, the subject you're talking about in terms of the social fabric. Um, if we go back to the 1950s or 60s, we all got our news from Walter Cronkite or whomever, um, and there was a, in effect a shared knowledge base, it seems to me, among society at, at large. Um, today, we have not only this very personalized um, uh, inflection of opinion and comment through the social media, but we, we also have uh, these channels that are, are uh, really focusing on reinforcing the filter bubble kind of thing, reinforcing what we already believe. Have you and your, your colleagues thought about that from a kind of a societal cohesion perspective? Mm -hmm. It strikes me as a very difficult question. I think it is a very difficult question, and I think it's, um, it's something that has been happening for a long time, so it's not going to be something that Un right. <laughs> that, that we unwind right. very quickly. But it does raise the question of what kind of a society do we want to move toward and where we are now. Um, and I mentioned the importance of being able to listen and to be empathic toward one another. I think that's really, really key to what we need to see going forward. I also think that education and literacy play a really important role here as well. That, that I think it's important for young people to have opportunities to learn how to how they might utilize social media in a variety of ways as citizens. Um, for the most part, we have approached social media at this point in our lives in, as a society as a problem and as a distraction. We've yeah. thought of it as something that can be a real uh, difficulty, you know, and, and that's actually a policy in many schools to not even have access to social media while you're in school. And I understand that because it is really frustrating as a faculty member if you, you know, have students who want to be on Snapchat <laughs> during yeah. your class or something. But but, um, but it means that I think we're missing an opportunity for us to be able to talk with young people and then be able to shape how we all think about the ways that we interact with one another in various spaces in our lives. So that if we had places for us to, to talk with young people about uses of social media, what does it mean when they share, how do they evaluate what they find, how do you actually find evidence to make sure that what you're sharing or what you're reading is truthful. And to me, part of that comes from a competency in knowing how things happen within media. So it's not just a matter of knowing truth, which is obviously important and being able to evaluate, but it also comes to understanding how our, how does television get put together and how is social media operating? What are the platforms? What, what are the choices that are being made behind the scenes that we don't think about on our daily basis. I think young people need to know those things so that they can uh, learn to leverage the media environment and can learn how to participate in public life in a way that is meaningful. Because I think we need to have many different voices participating and listening to each other. And we can only do that as people become more competent in having those conversations in a variety of places in society. I think society. that's a wonderful point. So let me ask you, um, at a personal level, you, you undertook this major study. Um, I think you've come up with some path-breaking ideas. Wh what's, what's been your personal takeaway from this project? What, what sort of has stuck with you personally? I think there are a couple of different dimensions to that. I think that, that if it's stuck with me personally, on the one hand, I'm a mom. Uh. So, <laughs> so I do have two teenage children right now. So this is very much a personal issue for me. Sure. And I think there were some things that I observed in the research that influenced the way that I parent. For instance, you know, I grew up in a time when um, I could come home from school and watch my parents read the newspaper or watch the six o'clock news. And that became part of our family rhythm, you know, mm -hmm. to talk about news because they were reading the news and they were watching it. 
right. Well, when my young people, when my kids come home from school, they have seen their mom on a laptop. <laughs> and so I could be watching news, but I also could be playing games. Yeah. You know, they don't really know <laughs> or, or doing work, you know, and doing emailing. Sure. So um, I think that it's important for parents. This is something that I've taken away. I think that it's, I've tried to be much more conscious about how I want to bring up news items for my children and also try to be more aware of what might be newsworthy to them so that I can share with them, for instance, when the school board is making a decision that's going to affect policies in their curriculum of their school. Or we can talk about you know, what's happening about immigration and how that might affect the makeup of their school body so that then they can participate in conversations around the dinner table, which I think has always you know, happened in, in, in some families. But I think it's especially important now um, when social media in some ways actually make it more difficult for young people to mm -hmm. see what's happening in the lives of the adults around them. Um, I also think that it's influenced my teaching. So I do teach journalism classes and I feel like it's important for the young people to understand the skills of making media um, because one of the things that was most inspiring for me of the, for, uh, from the project overall was seeing how young people were able to go from recognizing a problem in their community to utilizing media so that they weren't just trying to create a news story in the sense of becoming a journalist, but they saw themselves as participating in this connective journalism process that led them to want to make a new story about their community. And that meant telling a journalistic story, but it also meant um, figuring out ways that they could leverage the media environment to try to help policymakers and others to pay attention to things that they felt policymakers were not paying attention to. So I feel like there's a real implication there for what's been called solutions journalism in terms of how young people and people of all ages can be involved in thinking about the role of media in solving the problems we face every day. Finally, um, one of the goals of the en Engaging Ideas series is, is to provide a platform for people to discuss these kinds of very topics. Um, what would be the, the takeaways that you would offer our viewers? What things might they think about or discuss with friends on this really important subject? Well, I think one thing that they could discuss would be how they get news, um, to think about uh, you know, what our patterns are now. Um, and as adults, we can reflect on how we get news, but we also might want to reflect on how we got news 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. ago. Um, because I think that it probably, we probably weren't quite as tuned in to NPR and <laughs> <laughs> the nightly news and whatever our, you know, whatever our news habits are now. I know I wasn't <laughs> when I was a teenager. And so I think we want to recognize that young people are citizens in process, citizens in the making, mm -hmm. and uh, that and then that that is important and that what they're doing in social media is really exciting in many ways, but also that we have a role that we can play as adults in helping to accompany them, not necessarily just to lead them and direct them and to try to discipline them, but also to stand with them and to share with them and to listen to them and help them to have the spaces that they need in our society, whether it's in schools, in social media platforms, that will protect the interests of the democracy that we all want to be a part of. Well, my thanks to Professor Lynn Schofield Clark for sharing her findings uh, and some very interesting conversation. I hope you'll join us in the future as we bring more engaging ideas from the academy to the community. I'm Jim Grismer. Thank you for watching.